today at your place settings, we do have the budget books. Um, and there's going to be two colored books. One is green, one is blue. And we'll just reference on the days when we have the budget report outs, which uh, budget book to look at. Obviously, today, I think it's just the, the green binder that we're going to be looking at. Um, committee, you also should have received at your place settings are the proposed 2022 assignments and pay policy for temporary legislative employees. That was submitted to us by uh, Tom Day. Um, next, are there any bill introductions this morning? All right, seeing none. You should also have at your uh, place settings uh, the annual reports for the National Center for Aviation Training from Wichita State University Tech, National Institute of Aviation Research from Wichita State University, Global Food Systems from Kansas State University, the University of Kansas Cancer Center, and the Midwest Stem Cell Therapy Center. So you can take a look at those at your leisure. Uh, the next item, uh, you should have received a copy of the minutes from the February 1st meeting. Were there any changes to those minutes? I see none. Uh, Representative Helgerson. I move the adoption of the minutes. All right, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second by Representative Carlin. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The minutes are approved. I will now turn it over to uh, the budget report outs with Chairman Sutton from the General Government Budget Committee and please indicate which budget you're going to be starting with Chairman Sutton. Where is Chairman Sutton? Yeah. <laughs> that's nice to know since he's on the agenda and he's the only one that's going to be doing budget report outs. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we'll wait for Chairman Sutton to come back to the committee room. And actually, we're, uh, we'll move on to the next item, and that is going to be working on House Bill 2548. Uh, is Natalie readily available? Go ahead. All right, I will um, turn it over to uh, Vice Chairman Hoffman uh, to just give us a briefing on what 2548 does from the Joint Committee on Information Technology. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if you remember, 2548 would uh, change some provisions in the reporting for our IT projects. It would uh, give JCIT the ability to see these projects uh, before they're sent out for an RFP. There was an amendment that uh, I, or there was two amendments actually that I had put um, forward when we did the hearing. I um, have asked that those amendments all be put into uh, one amendment. There's, there's an additional small little uh, change in it also in that right now it says that if two members ask for a meeting within 24 hours after KLRD gets that, they would they would um, schedule a, a, a meeting, or they would let the the chairman know that a meeting needs to be scheduled. We changed that to first um, or the next um, business day, in case that those would come on a weekend or a Friday or something like that. So um, that's the only changes. Natalie should be bringing the amendments down when she gets here. So that's and there's Representative Sutton. Well, since we're working the bill for 2548, we'll stay on that topic for right now. But um, yes, I move that we pass out uh, 2548 favorable. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second by Representative Tarwater. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. And then uh, we're going to be working the bill now. So. Oh, okay. um, We'll be waiting for Natalie for the amendment to come up. Well, we made a motion to work the bill. I mean, he said, yeah, he said favorably for passage. So do you want to yeah. um, <laughs> refrain your motion? I move that we work the work uh, 2548. OK. All right. Now you've heard the motion. Is there a second? You don't agree with that? We need to make the amendments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Second by Representative Tarwater. Um, and we'll be waiting for Natalie uh, to come up with the amendment. So we'll be just at ease for a while.
Lee has come into committee, and so uh, Vice Chairman Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, move that we amend House Bill 2548 with the balloon amendment. And once I get it passed out, if I could ask Natalie to maybe go over the, the changes real quickly. That's fine. Um, committee, you've heard a motion to amend. Is there a second? Second by Representative Rogers. Uh, all those in favor to amend? Well, actually, we'll hear the amendment first. So, Natalie, if you could um, describe the amendment. Sure. Thank you, Chairman Waymaster. Um, the amendment you have in front of you combines the two amendments that were distributed when you guys heard this bill. Um, so the first change adds, um, um, aligns that information that has to be provided, that documentation has to conform with what ITEC actually adopts in their policies. Um, so that was the amendment that Alan kind of alluded to, saying that he wanted um, that to match with that ITEC statute. Over the next change actually was not in either of the balloons that were distributed um, to the committee when you heard this bill, but the bill as proposed would require the Director of Legislative Research to um, contact the chair um, about the meeting that is being requested within 24 hours, and this would change that to the next business day following that request. And then um, over on page 10, that's the um, second amendment that was distributed to you guys when you heard this bill um, that changes to the joint committee. So now um, those uh, agency projects would be presented to the joint committee. The joint committee would then give a summary to appropriations and ways and means on those projects. And then um, the joint committee would um, be requiring the CETOs of those agencies to give those quarterly updates as opposed to the legislative CETO. And I can take any questions. All right, thank you, Natalie. Committee, are there any questions for Natalie regarding the amendment? Any further discussion in regards to the amendment to House Bill 2548? Seeing, uh, Representative Helgerson. Historically, we've had more problems with getting a handle and making good decisions. Is the author of the amendment comfortable that we're going to be able to make good decisions from now on and not... Uh, <laughs> uh, the bottom... It, it, it really comes down to trust. And, and I don't have the expertise to know this. I have the expertise to say, we've gotten screwed and just made bad decisions at times. So I'm looking to the committee and to the individual who made this and other individuals that may have more expertise on the computer side. You know, is this the way to go? Is, is, is it better to, is this the way or should we hire a consultant and spend blank thousands of dollars to make sure that we're making good decisions. Vice Chairman Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I hope we're making progress. I, I don't think at this point we want to hire a consultant. I, I don't want to you know, spend the money. We have some really good people on JCIT that are I, IT, some, you know, some of them are IT people. This is going to at least move us in the direction that these projects are seen and scrutinized by the legislature you know, or legislators, a group of legislators, before they're put out for RFP. Um, whether, I, I mean, I'm not going to say that it's always going to be, we're always going to get exactly what we were hoping we would get. I mean, I think that's <laughs> IT and, and uh, things change and it seems like we can do our best in trying to get a company and still not necessarily get exactly what we're hoping we get. But um, at least this will give us the scrutiny before those RFPs are, are put out on, on some of these projects to hopefully have a little bit more input in them um, above where we are now. I think it's a step in the right direction. I guess we'll see what happens in the future if, if we're able to uh, move the needle in a better way with it. Representative Helgerson. Well, I hate the idea of consultants, but at the same time, uh, I can think of one project right off that we could have paid for all the consultants that we would have needed in the last 30 or 40 years. So, 
if you're comfortable that this is the way to head, that's fine. But, you know, um, I have real reservations just about how we've been handling our systems in the past years, many years. Vice Chairman Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we've, uh, you know, I think it's been a one of those things that when I, you know, years ago when, when we started doing these IT projects, they were smaller, the, you know, they weren't as big of a deal, and, and everybody focused I keep bringing back the building committee, but everybody focused on buildings, the brick and mortar and everything. We're, we're spending more in IT than brick and mortar anymore. And so I think that this, this gets us to a better spot where we are having more oversight on these projects before they go forward. Representative Helkerson. You touched on an issue that I have. Do we have down anywhere that says how much we spend every year? Uh, for new computer purchases or computer software, or do you know, Vice Chairman Hoffman? Yeah, I I wouldn't be able to. I would just tell you that I think in my testimony I said we were at something like two hundred and some th million right now of IT projects that are that are in the the queue. That's one thing that JCIT has been kind of pushing. Two is we would like to see the IT s split out more in these budgets. Uh, we'd like to see more of of a uh, this is this is what we're spending on IT, and that's just going to that's just going to be a change in how the agencies report it. And you know whether we I, I don't know if we can't get them to to do it voluntarily, maybe we do have to come up with some sort of a something. That, let's say that they have to, but. That's, I agree. We, we don't really have a good idea sometimes of how much uh, they are spending on IT. So, I don't know. Representative Helgerson, any further questions? <laughs> no, I just go into editorializing. <laughs> Representative Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Absolutely unrelated to the bill itself, but to the previous discussion that is relevant. Um, it seems to me that when we're looking at each individual agency, um, the IBAR report doesn't necessarily split out IT specifically. It falls under either professional services, if we have consultants uh, or programmers, or contractual services. And so I, I think simply adding a line in the IBAR, I say simply, I don't know how simple that is, but uh, uh, that might be a way that we can track it a little bit more, more carefully. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, this is not meant to be a funny question. Who is IT? I mean, we keep talking about IT, but who is IT? You know, if we don't like something, we go to that organization or that office or something, but who really is IT? Vice Chairman Hoffman. Um, every, every agent, well, I wouldn't say every agency because some of them are small enough they maybe don't have a designated IT person, but um, almost every agency has a group of information technology is what IT stands for, and that's there. There are people that work on our computers in the legislative. That's the computer services downstairs. Right. They work on our computers. They keep the network going. That's that's when we talk IT. That's kind of the uh, anything if technology kind of falls in that IT um, okay. area. I was, I was thinking that's what it was, but when we just yeah. use that. But, you know, the other thing is, number one, when, when I think you just mentioned we get the computers. All right, so we get them in mass, and we get, uh, we have negotiated a rate in order for us to do it. All right. The question is, we have to have it, right? So when we talk about how much money we spend on it, we have to have those computers. When I first came here, there was one computer in an office for everybody. And uh, eventually, but then they had only had it for a year. So I'm just trying to think how much we spend. If we negotiate the price, that's one thing. But other than that, do we have a, another option? I mean, if we don't get the new computers or we don't have those people when something happens to our computer and we call downstairs or, you know, they come up and fix it, what would we do? Vice Chairman Hoffman. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I don't think it's a question of whether we spend it. I think it's a question of how it's being spent. And are we spending $70 million on a on a new uh, program that we could get it for $3 million? Um, I, I think that's the, that's the question. Um, going back to your IT, the, every, every branch has a CETA, which is, which is the main, um, the chief information technology office. We have one, that's Alan Weiss. Um, the administration has one, that's uh, um, Secretary Burns Wallace. And the judicial has one, it's uh, Kelly, and I can't remember his last name. Or, but so they're in charge of the, you know, the IT in each one of the of the of the legisl or the branches, okay. and so I, you know, I think that with some changes in the accounting, I think we could get a fairly good idea of how IT is being spent. But it will it will make take some changes in how they report it, how they break it out, and I'm not sure. I'm not. I don't know if we're there yet. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that because I didn't really understand what all of that is. And when I'm looking at this and I see so much is crossed out in this bill, it's almost as if most of the bill was crossed out, you know, and, and then we move on. So I just was trying to get a better feel for it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, and I probably should have covered this the, the first time. We can s see a great deal of the IT expenses when we look at the OITS budget. All right, that's that covers that. That's not everybody. That that covers executive branch, mostly. All right, there there are some agencies that aren't necessarily uh, using the services of OITS, although I am encouraging it in committee, uh, just because of the of the uh, volume, we can get better prices. But the the fun part with the OITS budget is that most of it is off budget. It's interdepartmental. So following the, the spending on that is, is an interesting endeavor that I have, I kind of enjoy, but I'm not sure um, you guys would enjoy the off-budget reporting nearly as much when I report out the OITS budget. It, it gets a little, bit, uh, a little bit complicated. But you do see that off-budget expenditure reflected in the agencies, and that's when you see, you know, IT uh, costs, IT costs, you know, modernization, what have you. You'll see it reflected there, but you can't really get your arms around the entire number unless you look at the off-budget uh, OITS. Thank you. If, if that helps at all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman. Representative Ballard. Yes, it, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, it does, because I was about to ask, well, then what's the role of o, OITS? And then I thought, wait a minute, maybe I don't really understand that part, but that explains it. So thank you. That's point one for you today. Any further discussion or questions in regards to the amendment? All right, seeing none, Vice Chairman Hoffman, you may move your amendment. I move my amendment. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Amendment passes. Further discussion on House Bill 2548. All right, seeing none, Vice Chairman Hoffman. Now I'll move uh, House Bill 2548 out favorable as amended. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second by Representative Tarwater. Any other discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes and the bill is passed out as amended. All right, now we will turn it over to the budget report outs with Chairman Sutton and please indicate which budget you're going to be starting with this morning. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I do apologize for the delay. I thought there was a little bit more on the agenda prior to the budget report outs this morning. Uh, let's get started with the Office of the Attorney General because it's sitting here on top. The agency for 2022, the agency requests 31.3 million, including 6.7 million in SGF. Now, this is an all funds increase of 3.9 million, including an SGF decrease of $211,000 from, uh, from the 22 approved amount. The all funds increase is primarily attributable to the receipt of opioid litigation settlement funds, uh, which are then dispersed back out. Uh, with a formula that we can get into if you like, but, but uh, there is an existing formula for disbursement of those funds. 
Uh, both funds were, in fact, this may get into some of the explanation. Both funds were established pursuant to 2021 uh, and HB 2079 for the receipt of opioid litigation settlement monies. The bill requires that 75% of all monies received by the state pursuant to opioid litigation in which the AG is involved for the abatement or remediation of substance abuse or addiction be deposited into the KFA fund and 25% of all monies received to be deposited into the MFA fund. That's for municipalities. Uh, the KFA, oh, and it gets into the description of that here too, so I don't e even need to editorialize. The KFA fund monies will be used as grants to qualified applicants for projects and, and activities that reduce, treat, or mitigate the effects of substance abuse and addiction and provide support to the prescription drug monitoring program administered by the Board of Pharmacy. The agency's revised estimate includes 2.6 million in expenditures, all from the KFA fund for the purpose in uh, for this purpose in 22. Uh, the agency's revised estimate also includes $996,000 in expenditures, all from the MFA fund in 2022 monies. Uh, monies in the MFA fund are to be expended subject to an agreement among the Attorney General, the Kansas Association of Counties, and the League of Kansas Municipalities for projects and activities that prevent, reduce, treat, or mitigate the effects of substance abuse and addiction, or to reimburse a municipality for expenses related to previous substance abuse mitigation. The agency request also includes 177.4 FTE positions, which is an increase of 2.1 positions above the 22 approved number. In fiscal year 22, uh, two FTE positions are requested for additional auditors in the Office of the Medicaid Inspector General, and 0.1 FTE is requested for the Consumer Protection Division. Uh, the governor recommends expenditures of 31.2 million, including 6.7 SGF in 22. This is an all funds decrease of $43,000 below the agency re revised estimate and is due to the governor's recommend recommendation not to adopt the agency's supplemental request of $43,319 SGF and two FTE positions for additional personnel in the office of the Medicaid Inspector General in fiscal year 22. The Budget Committee concurs with the Governor's recommendation in 22 with the following adjustments. Uh, add $7.4 million, all from special revenue funds, to adjust receipts of opioid litigation settlements monies in uh, fiscal year 22. Based on litigation developments after submission of its budget, the Office of the Attorney General now anticipates significantly larger recoveries than originally estimated. In particular, the agency estimates an increase of 7.4 million in 22 and 34.3 million for 23, so we'll see that one here in just a minute. Pursuant to the Kansas Fights Addiction Act, these settlement monies are deposited into the Kansas Fights Addiction Fund and the Municipalities Fight Addiction Fund uh, before passing through to applicants and local governments. <laughs> The Budget Committee also recommended adding $43,319 SGF and two FTE positions for two new auditor positions within the Office of the Medicaid Inspector General for 22. The office currently has two auditors to inspect and review the state Medicaid program. The agency indicates adding two new positions would increase the number of audits and reviews uh, the office is able to complete each year as well as allow for continuity of ongoing audits if an auditor position becomes vacant. The agency requested supplemental funding for these positions, but the governor did not include them in 22. Funding for this request is included in both the agency request and the governor's recommendation for 23. With that, I'll stand for questions. All right, committee, are there any questions for Chairman Sutton in regards to 2022? Representative Wolfmore. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. On the number two, the addition that the 43,000, okay, it's probably just 43,000 for two positions because it's just the last few months of 2022. Correct. And they don't question. even anticipate using all of that. We just wanted to get the ball rolling as far as the hiring process is concerned. And then, thank you for that. And then, it doesn't, are you not planning on having those positions in 2023? You'll you'll see those in the in 23. The governor did recommend them, however, in 23. Got it. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. That clears that up. Representative Estes. Thank you. I have a, a a newbie question. On page 154, the chart with the Medicaid fraud prosecution revolving fund. The revenue is that just from grants, or is that money recovered, or a combination of? Chairman Sutton. 
if I'm remembering the table correctly, those are uh, settlement recoveries. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Okay. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. More of a comment than anything. Um, we have about 55,000 folks on the Medicaid program because we haven't been able to um, audit our program and kick anybody off since the fe the um, um, I'm drawing a blank here, but since it began, the pandemic money, and uh, we will be having to audit the entire 600 and, well, there's 455,000 people on that, so we will be in that process of auditing that over the next few months as soon as the pandemic uh, funding ends. So that's, I'm glad to see you start that process because they're going to need all the help they can get to, to get through that. So very good. Thank you. Representative Carlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, you mentioned hiring two new auditors. Um, I am looking, I've been looking at this 2021 report of the Medicaid ex uh, inspector, the okay. Office of the Inspector General. And in that report, it said that no audits were made in 2021. Um, it, I don't know that you all would have this in front of you, but it's it, something I was watching. Um, the number of audits of Medicaid, Medican, and SHIP, and the other uh, dollar savings, if any, resulting from those audits. No audits were completed in CY21. However, three reviews were completed, blah, blah, blah. But um, I, is that because there were no auditors in 21? Is your mic on? Ah uh, yes. Okay, well, just we have some members who said they couldn't hear you. I wasn't close enough. I'm sorry. Did you not hear? Do I need to repeat? Oh no, I, I heard you. I'm just looking it up, looking up the answer here. Because well, and and the um, there was another spot that I saw a really big figure. Um, the on page nine of that report, it says that the failure of CanCare staff to timely and efficiently process cases where Medicaid beneficiaries had died caused a substantial overpayment to the MCOs of $19,202,000, which is kind of a big figure. And so I'm just wondering because actually I wrote the bill that got the Medicaid inspector a long time ago. And so I kind of watched this. Chairman Sutton. Right. One moment. Let me, I'm looking this up even as we speak. And to uh, Representative Estes's question, I believe the money that she was inquiring about does come from settlement of fraud cases from the federal government. Is that correct? Thank you. She was looking on some kind of report. Chairman Sutton. Well, this one, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this kind of threw me for a loop because I didn't have any information pointing to zero audits. In fact, when I look at the uh, budget, I show that the uh, number of audits and reviews completed in 21 were actually two and uh, audit reviews and investigation related trainings were 11. 
it, I mean, it looks like there may have been kind of a downtick, but no, this is still certainly ongoing. I, I don't, I'm not sure where the, where the number of zero came into play here at all. Representative Carlin. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, um, and, and thank you, uh, Representative Sutton. But uh, it does read that there were no audits of Medi Medicaid beneficiaries that had died. I think so. It's a specific group that they made that they failed to audit. I don't know that there were no audits completed in the agency, but that's just what it uh, in the review of capitation payments report. So. Um, it just was a lot of money, um, and we did have a lot of deaths in 21. So just I think we need to get an answer from the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further discussion on fiscal year 2022? Chairman Sutton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could go uh, a little bit more into, into that one. As far as the amount of money identified for repayment or recovery in 21, uh, that was about 1.3 million. So even with a bit of a downtick, and I, I guess they didn't, the two auditors on staff didn't cover that specific. Uh, there wasn't an, a specific investigation into into uh, uh, Medicaid deaths, I guess. But uh, uh, no, they still recovered 1.3, almost 1.4 million dollars. Thank you. I just don't know how the money works. You know, there's a lot of different ways you report money out in and out and different parts of budgets. And I'm not familiar with the whole attorney general budget. This is a specific question on that piece. And I can check with, uh, well, I, I would like the attorney general to give us a report of that. Answer that question, why it's in this report and what's been done about it. Thank Chairman you. Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We can certainly request that of the Attorney General. Representative Helgerson. Could we ask that the Attorney General break it down? Because there are federal funds that come uh, unrelated to state activities that are reimbursement. And this is investigations done on providers. And then there is state, uh, I'll call it uh, irregularities that are found by state uh, inspectors. Then there's also the inspectors that would look individually at Medicaid recipients. And it would be helpful if we had, my memory is that most of the fund comes from, most of the dollars that we recover over a long period of time is from federal uh, sources. But if we could have broken down on those sources, that'd be great. We can do that. Thank you. Any further discussion on fiscal year 2022? All right, seeing none, Chairman Sutton, Move on to 2023. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For fiscal year 2023, the agency requests 26.9 million, including 6.3 million SGF. Uh, this is an all funds decrease of 4.4 million and SGF decrease of 400,000 uh, below the 22 revised estimate. The agency's request includes a decrease of 2.5 million, all from the KFA fund, and a decrease of 944,000, all from the MFA fund for 23. The, do, the decrease, and we'll revisit this here in a minute, but at the, at the moment that the budget was submitted, uh, this decrease is due to receipts of federal opioid lit litigation settlement monies, the majority of which will be awarded as grants throughout the state or transferred to Kansas municipalities. When the agency submitted its budget, it anticipated higher receipts in 22 than for 23, which results in decreased expenditures for 23. The decrease in SGF expenditures is primarily attributable to a decrease in litigation costs, uh, a decrease in operating expenses for the solicitor's division, and a decrease in state match expenditures for the Medicaid fraud and abuse division in 23. The agency request also includes 177.4 FTE positions, which is unchanged from the 22 revised estimate. Uh, the governor concurred with the agency's request for 23. The budget committee concurs with the governor's recommendation for 23 with the following adjustments. Uh, add 34.2 million, all from special revenue funds to adjust receipts of opioid litigation settlement monies for 23. Based on litigation developments after submission of its budget, the Office of the Attorney General now anticipates significantly larger recoveries than originally estimated. 
In particular, the agency estimates an increase of 7.4 million in 22, which we already covered, and 34.3 million in, in 23. Pursuant to the Kansas Fights Addiction Act, these settlement monies are deposited into the KFA and MFA uh, before passing through to applicants and local governments. The Budget Committee notes the state's legal expenses from, oh, this was just a, a kind of an aside, but we did want to make, make note of this for everyone to be aware of. Uh, the Budget Committee notes the state's legal expenses from litigation related to redistricting in 2012. The attorney fees uh, requested in Essex versus Kobach totaled $651,000, which the Office of the AG negotiated down to $379,000. Litigation expenses are difficult to predict because of the numerous variables involved, such as the number of plaintiffs, the relief sought, and the revenue, or and the venue, rather, sorry. Uh, the agency indicates using past numbers to predict future expenses would not provide a reliable estimate of legal expenses for any litigation related to the current redistricting process. Um, I think the thing that stands out the most there is that uh, 10 years ago we didn't have maps, so litigation was a slam dunk. So uh, this year we have, we have a map, but there will still be litigation costs, as we all know. I'll stand for questions. All right, committee, any questions for Chairman Sutton? Representative Humphreys. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, the extra the litigation developments at, that were extra for 22 and 23, um, you know that they're going into the Kansas, uh, Kansas Fights Addiction Act. So who uh, administrates those funds? And then, you know, on the local level, the municipalities fight addiction fund. I mean, where could, could you just say a little bit more about where those large sums of money will be exactly going and who will be administrating those? Chairman Sutton. Sure. The, now, the KFA is, is uh, uh, handled by the AG's office. That's administered by the, AF, the, G, the AG's office. The KFA is... Uh, <laughs> Help me, throw me a bone so here. That's what KFA is. There's a board in the office oh. that distributes the money. Okay, but uh, the no, MFA. MFA, right? yeah, it's a cooperation with the Kansas City Council. Counties mm -hmm. and leading this out. Right, and the MFA is a little bit, a little bit different in that that's a, a kind of a coordinated effort with the League of Kansas Municipalities and, and the counties that, that have, they, they also, Administer the twenty five percent. Representative Humphreys. And do we do you have a breakdown like for fiscal year twenty twenty three thirty four point three million? How much is going to the KFA and how much is going to the MFA? Sure, it's seventy five twenty five. It, it's a okay. I'm pre worked out formula. Yeah, seventy five to the AG's office and twenty five to the municipalities. Correct. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion in regards to fiscal year twenty twenty three? Chairman Sutton? Well, I, I was just going to say that that was actually a really fascinating development because with, with the opioid cases going on, there were hundreds of plaintiffs, all right? The counties, cities, you, you name it, individual. It was, it was, it, it was a massive uh, ball of twine to unwind here. And, and I think the, uh, the AG's office did a pretty, pretty fair job in getting everyone on board to working out this formula and, and, and sticking with the plan uh, as far as the disbursement of the settlement monies. Any further discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, Chairman Sutton. Uh, with that, I will move the Budget Committee recommendations for the Office of the Attorney General for 2022 and 2023. All right, committee, you've heard the motion, second by Representative Burroughs. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Chairman Sutton. That was fun. Let's go on to the Secretary of State. Let me pull it up real quick here. All right. For fiscal year 2022, the agency submits a revised estimate totaling $6 million, including $1.6 million from, the, from uh, HAVA funds. This is a decrease of $916,000 below the fiscal year 22 approved amount. During the 21 session, the Office of the Secretary 
uh, Secretary of State requested a transfer of $924,500 from SGF to the Democracy Fund to meet state match requirements for supplemental HAVA funds provided through the Federal Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act. That's through the CARES Act. However, the security of state of this... <laughs> Just a minute. My eyes are crossed. One moment. <laughs> All right. However, the Secretary of State was later notified that such state match requirements could be met with existing resources. The Office of the Secretary of State was able to meet state match requirements in 21, and this additional expenditure is no longer required in 22. The agency requests additional adjustments of $7,800, all from special revenue funds in 22. These adjustments comprise an increase in salaries and wages and contractual services, which is partially offset by a decrease in aid to local units of government. The agency's estimate also includes 41.5 FTE positions, which is a decrease of 5.5 below the 22 approved number. The agency been has been approved for 46 FTE positions since 18, and the agency revised this request in 22 to more accurately reflect current staffing levels. The governor concurs with the agency's revised estimate, and so did the budget committee. Are there any questions in regards to fiscal year 2022? Seeing none, oh, Representative Tarwater. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just curious, we passed a bill last year that allowed the Secretary of State some leeway as far as printing goes. Was that discussed? I, I was just kind of curious to see if we, how, if we saved any money by doing that. That wasn't discussed in committee. It had completely escaped my mind. That's an excellent question, however, and I don't know the answer. Thank you. Any further questions in regards to fiscal year 2022? Seeing none, Chairman Sutton, move on to 2023. All right. For 2023, the agency requests 5.6 million, including 1.2 million from HAVA funds for 23. This is a decrease of 344,000 below the 22 revised estimate. The agency requests expenditures of 1.6 million from special revenue funds for the HAVA program in 23. This is a decrease of 353,000 below the 22 revised estimate. This decrease is attributable to a decrease of $300,000 in expenditures from federal HAVA Title I funds, one-time expenditures for firewall upgrades and computer replacements totaling $50,000, and HAVA state match requirements of $3,000 that occurred in 22, but do not recur in 23. The remaining adjustments include an increase of $8,800 in salaries and wages expenditures. This is attributable to an increase in employer contributions for fringe benefits, such as group health insurance. The agency request includes 41.5 FTE positions, which is unchanged from 22. The governor concurred, and so did the budget committee. Committee, any questions for Chairman Sutton regarding fiscal years 2022 or 2023 for the Secretary of State? Seeing none, Chairman Sutton. With that, I will move the budget recommendations for the Secretary of State's office for 2022 and 2023. All right, committee, you heard the motion, seconded by Representative Burroughs. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Chairman Sutton. Well, we're on a roll. Let's just keep on going. Let's look at the office of the governor. For fiscal year 2022, the agency requests a revised estimate of $50.2 million, including $8.5 million SGF. This is an increase of $12.4 million above the 22 approved amount. The agency's revised estimate includes expenditures of $7 million in CRF money. The CRF is the largest source of state funding provided in the, uh, in the CARES Act. The agency was allocated a total of $1 billion in discretionary monies through CRF, which must be used for expenditures related to the COVID-19 public health emergency. The agency's revised estimate includes $3.5 million from the State Fiscal Recovery Fund provided in the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. These expenditures are for operating costs for the Office of Recovery. These expenditures include $8 million for outside auditors and accountants for the distribution of funding and expenditures uh, for salaries and, and wages. 
The agency's revised estimate also includes a decrease of $16,571 in, CS, in uh, coronavirus emergency supplemental funding expenditures. The CESF, authorized through the CARES Act, provides funding to prevent, prefer, prepare for, and respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Specifically for state and local units of government and federally recognized Indian tribal governments performing law enforcement functions. The governor's grant office anticipates an increase of $700,000 in federal uh, uh, Violence Prevention and Services Act grant expenditures in 22. The FVPC PSA is a federal program to prevent incidents of family violence, domestic violence, and dating violence. Provide immediate shelter, supportive services, and access to community-based programs for victims of, vi of family violence, domestic violence, or dating violence, and their dependents. And provide specialized services for children exposed to family, domestic, or dating violence. Including victims who are members of underserved populations. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services provides funding for this grant. The governor's grant office also anticipates an increase of $1.3 million in, in VOCA grant expenditures in 22. All other adjustments include an increase of uh, $1,300 SGF due to an increase in operating expenditures for the Office of the Governor and Lieutenant Governor, which estimates a corresponding decrease in special revenue funds of $42,000. The agency also estimates additional federal funding decreases of $17,280. The governor concurred with her own budget, which shocked us all. <laughs> the budget committee concurs with the governor's recommendation with the following notations. The committee received testimony regarding reduced federal funding for the VOCA federal fund and encourages the House Committee on Appropriations to study the issue. Last year, Congress passed the, the VOCA fix, uh, that made the news anywhere, to replenish the federal fund, which had dwindled in recent years. Uh, the fix is expected to soon generate sufficient, uh, sufficient revenue to maintain level funding for crime victims assistance uh, programs. According to testimony by the Kansas Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence, the Kansas Governor Grants uh, Program Office, located in the office of the governor, notified the coalition on February 4, 2022, of an estimated $22 million shortfall in federal VOCA funds for 23. That could be a big deal, but we don't know the exact number yet, so we couldn't, well, and we'll see that in 23, we couldn't make a specific dollar request to backfill those funds, but it's something that we need to keep on our radar. Uh, the committee notes that workforce services and child care are key challenges in Kansas and that the Office of Recovery through the SPARC Executive Committee should give strong consideration to dedicating available federal coronavirus response funds as advised by the Department of Commerce and the Kansas Children's Cabinet to meet the needs. Furthermore, the SPARC advisory panels uh, should consider implementation of the Garden City model of child care assistance. Don't ask me questions on that one because I'm not terribly familiar with that program. In fact, I'm not familiar with that program at all, but I hear that, it's a, that it works well. It was the will of the committee that, that uh, perhaps we should look into that. And it's included in this budget because it would probably come through the governor's grant office. I'll stand for questions. Well, and I would I would presume that um, when the advisory panel for economic development would probably be addressing uh, the needs for daycare across the state of Kansas, um, and I don't know if uh, Representative Tarwater has any comments on that, but um, I would I would presume that we'll be having discussion in in regards to that on that advisory panel. That sounds fabulous, Representative Wolfmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, thank you for putting in number two. Child care, it's, we saw that. I think it, it's always been an issue, but it got elevated and got recognized more during the pandemic. So thank you for that notation. Um, when you talk about workforce services and child care, workforce services, do you mean like training and education programs? Is that? Tra transportation as tra well was okay. something that was discussed. Great. And then I won't ask you about Garden City model. Good, of because child I care couldn't assistance. answer you. Um, and then my last question is, um, did these groups make application to the appropriate um, SPARC committee? 
Not that I'm aware of, but that doesn't mean anything because we were hearing the governor's budget, and so they might not have even come to us to talk about it. Okay. I, okay. I can't I'll, answer that. Uh, I will check, and thank you so much. Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm just curious, is there anywhere in our book that sort of breaks out a little bit of those 68.8 FTEs? I'm just curious, you know, what I'm, I, I know some of it's uh, Lieutenant Governor and so on, but I'm just, is there anywhere that breaks that out or I don't can we get know that the information? answer to that. Let me see if I can find it. Now, this is not the right page number. This is my old draft copy. But the program performance measure overview has this by program. So how much now is there? Oh, very nice. Very nice. Uh, Amy just said that it's on page 76. 76, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman. But Chairman Sutton. Analyst Deer was ready. He had it. <laughs> I was ready to answer. My lifeline was answered. Representative Ballard. Oh, I thought he was answering. Thank you. Um, I, I too appreciate too. And I cannot tell you everything about the Garden City model, but when we uh, were in Dodge City for, um, well, uh, Dodge City, Dodge City was talking about the Garden City. Uh, model when we went on our listening tour for the redistricting and I wondered about that as well then I came back on campus and then I heard again from a student who is an intern in that program and she raved about her program so I hope they have uh, submitted an application because I hear it's very unique what they have done with their program I just wanted to toss that in only because I didn't know anything about it but on two instances I heard about it yeah, I've, I've heard good things. I just don't know anything about the mechanics of it. Representative Estes. Thank you. I just have a, a process newbie question. on um, If these federal grants, the, the nearly 700,000 in federal grants, don't come through because D.C. doesn't always meet, move at the speed we expect, what happens? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if the funds aren't there, they can't be dispersed. Um, now, we have some leeway in state government, depending upon our resources, that perhaps we can backfill. Sometimes that's possible, sometimes that's not. And it would be the will of this committee that would make that determination. But uh, uh, in, in, the, in the broad picture, if the funds aren't there, they can't be dispersed. Thank you. Any further questions in regards to fiscal year 2022? All right, seeing none, Chairman Sutton. Very good. Well, moving on to fiscal year 2023, the agency requests $56.2 million, including $8.2 million for 23. Uh, this is an increase of $6 million above the 22 revised estimate. The American Rescue Plan was enacted on March 11, 21 and provides $1.9 trillion in federal spending to assist in response, and, uh, response to and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. That was trillion with a T, by the way. Uh, it is the sixth in a series of federal legislation providing COVID-19 relief totaling 5.2, again with a T, trillion. Uh, entities in Kansas are estimated to be allocated over 4.9 billion that was with a B, in COVID-19 federal relief as part of ARPA. Federal agencies continue to determine allocations and guidance, and in some instances, allocations are dependent on application or opt-in requirements. The agency estimates $19.6 million in ARPA expenditures for 23. This is an increase of $16.1 million above the 22 revised estimate. The agency estimates decreases in federal coronavirus relief fund monies and coronavirus emergency supplemental fund monies for 23. Guess the printing presses are dying down. Additionally, the agency estimates a decrease in uh, VOCA grant expenditures uh, and, exp and Family Violence Prevention and Services Act expenditures and expenditures for Project Safe Neighborhoods grant program. The agency requests additional adjustments, including a decrease of $323,000 in SGF expenditures. The agency decreased the request for SGF monies for other assistance for domestic violence prevention grants and child advocacy's advocacy center grants due to a lack of reappropriated funding for 2023. 
In addition to the reduction in SGF expenditures, the agency estimates a decrease of $340,000 in other expenditures for 23. This includes a decrease of 19.6 for expenditures related to training and conferences. Other reductions in federal funding are for Paul uh, Coverdell Forensic Science Improvement Grants, Sexual Assault Services, and the Violence Against Women Act. <coughs> Uh, the governor concurred with the 23 with their own budget, and the House concurred with the governor on that one. I'll stand for questions. All right. Uh, committee, are there any questions or discussion on fiscal year 2023? I'm, I'm not going to make a motion right now, but I was alerted some time ago, um, and I had talked to uh, research and the revisor's office, and the chairman and I have also discussed this as well when we had our um, chairman meetings. And um, I had a request from the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, and they were wanting to see if there was any allocation that could be made uh, to the Kansas Holocaust Commission in regards to their annual commemoration of the Holocaust. And we've had discussions, and, and basically they said the appropriate channel for this would be through the governor's grant office. Um, but I'm, like I said, I'm not going to make a motion. I just wanted to bring that out and discuss it and let everybody be aware of that uh, because when we put the budget together, we'll probably revisit that with an actual dollar figure um, that they may be requesting. And I don't know if that would fall under minority affairs or if that could be used with CARES Act money. We also needed to decide what grant program that would come out of. Right. Um, but I just want to let the committee be aware of that. Chairman Sutton? I, I would, would support that. I just want to figure out what bucket it comes out of. I, th I think that's probably going to be the, the, the tougher lift on that is try to figure out where. Um, so much of the governor's office, as you may have noticed, uh, the, the governor's office, SGF-wise, is very, very small uh, as, as far as the expenditures are concerned. The vast majority of the money is federal funds that come in and go out and come in and go out that really, as far as appropriations are concerned, all we're doing is seeing how much. It's not really a, a question of, of the allocation thereof. However, we could, in that case, make a specific request for uh, the application of those federal funds. All right. Any further discussion in regards to fiscal year 2023? Seeing none, Chairman Sutton. I will move the Budget Committee's uh, recommendations for the Office of the Governor for 2022 and 2023. All right, Committee, you've heard the motion. Uh, seconded by Representative Burroughs. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? G guys, you can do better than that. That was motion not passes. at best. <laughs> Chairman Sutton. My dulcet tones have lulled you all to sleep, I can tell. Well, let's go to the Office of the State Treasurer now that we're all up and energetic. The agency estimates revised expenditures of $32 million, all from special revenue funds. This, by the way, this is an entirely fee-funded agency. Uh, this is an increase of $3.6 million, or 12.7% above the approved amount. The agency estimates unclaimed property claim payments of 27.2 million in 22. This is an increase of 9.4 million in claims above the 21 actual. Uh, the agency reported a decrease in unclaimed property claims during the COVID-19 pandemic and anticipates claims to increase in 22. The agency requests an additional 3.6 million all from the unclaimed properties claims act or claims fund in 22 to make these additional claim payments. The agency's revised estimate includes other adjustments of $10,000. Uh, other adjustments include anticipated expenditures for the agency's computer replacement plan and anticipated increases in salaries and wages uh, expenditures for employer contributions to employee fringe benefits, such as group health insurance. The governor concurred with the agency's estimate and so did the House Budget Committee. Committee, any questions for fiscal year 2022? Representative Estes. Speaking of the, the computer project, did, did they give you any kind of an update on where they were and how that was going? <sighs> Chairman Sutton. One second. I believe so, but I don't have it pulled up. Just one second here. <clears throat> oh, 
Psalm 123. Hold on. That was not discussed. I have no notes on it anyway, so I, I have to think that that was not discussed. You, I don't recall it either. Thank you. Any further questions or comments or discussion? Seeing none, Chairman Sutton, you may move on to 2023. Okay, well, this one's a little bit more interesting. The agency requests $32.5 million, all from special revenue funds for 23. This is an increase of $321,000 above the 22 revised estimate. The agency estimates unclaimed property claim payments of $27.4 million, which is an increase of $200,000 above the 22 revised. The agency anticipates an in Increase in unclaimed property claims and payouts for 23. Agency requests 2.7 million for salaries and wages for fiscal year 23, which is an increase of $116,000 above the fiscal year 22. This increase is primarily attributed uh, to anticipated increases in employer contributions to uh, fringe benefits, such as group, group health insurance. The remaining increase is attributable to an anticipated increase in, can, in the kids matching grant program uh, matching funds. This increase is partially offset by a decrease of $21,000 in contractual services. Sounds like the computer, computer uh, program may be, may be winding up here. Uh, the governor recommends expenditures of $45.5 million, all from special revenue funds. This is an increase of $13 million, or 28.6% above the agency's 23 request. This is where things get interesting. The increase is an SGF transfer occurring on a quarterly basis to the sales tax revenue uh, uh, bonds, food sales tax revenue replacement fund. There's a mouthful. The funds would be used to hold Starbond districts harmless from the elimination of the sales tax on food and food ingredients as proposed by the governor. The budget committee concurs with the governor's recommendation for 23 with the following adjustment. Delete the $13 million and the transfer from the SGF from the Starbond's Food Sales Tax Revenue Replacement Fund for fiscal year 23 and review at omnibus. These funds are provided to hold Starbonds, Starbond districts harmless from the elimination of the sales tax on food. Uh, however, that legislation hasn't passed. So we thought baking that into the budget was a little bit um, premature. Uh, in fact, in light of what is passed in the Senate, uh, uh, I think this number might have to be a little bit higher. So we'll definitely be reviewing this one at Omnibus, but we just didn't feel comfortable including it at the budget in the budget at this point. And just for clarification, that passed the Senate Tax Committee. Right, not right, the, not the floor. floor the You're Senate. correct. You're correct. All right. Uh, Representative Wolfmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just, I think I know the answer to this, but just to be clear on that one, it wasn't that you were, uh, the committee was against holding star bond districts harmless. It's just you were, wanted to wait to see what happened with the legislation. It, exact, uh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There are so many variables involved here. I mean, sales tax might not go to z zero on all food or it might even include restaurants. You never know, and and or it might just be reduced. You know, we don't know what that's going to look like. Attaching a dollar figure to it right now would just be guessing. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, on the unclaimed property, are we historically right now uh, actually giving back more unclaimed property? I saw the twenty-seven million. I don't know what it would have been five years ago. Chairman Sutton. 27 million is a, is a reasonable level. It dipped down during COVID. And, and I had some questions about it. I was wondering why it would drop. Uh, you know, people are sitting at home. Maybe they had the opportunity to look through the treasurer's office. But the, uh, the reality is that there's a direct relationship between the claims and the outreach involved. And there was an outreach during the 20 and part of 21 to speak of at all. So the, the uh, claims went way, way down. Returning back to 27 million, that's, that's the right ballpark. That's what we can normally expect historically. 
Okay, so then if we look at the actual of 2021, which was $21 million, and it jumps up to $45 million, it's the $13 million plus the difference for mostly the unclaimed and then just a little bit for salary and wages? Correct. That's all of that. And then the last thing, it, it comes back to a discussion we had last week, a question that we had again today. The agency also requests 40 FTE positions. Um, would you clarify if those are filled or if those are authorized or if those are funded? Because in this particular uh, agency, it will have an impact on bills that are potentially going to be heard later in terms of FTE. Chairman Sutton. Sure. The FTE positions, uh, for 21, there were 39 that were filled. Uh, for 22 and 23, they're projected to be 40. Uh, if there's a variance, it's not going to be much. So basically, they have no shrinkage, shrinkage rate. They yeah, have I, like I think, almost I think a zero or one. Is, is pretty minimal. Okay, right. interesting. Thank you. Representative Estes. I'm sorry, my question just flew out of my. Okay, um, Star Bonds. When you guys took your position on Star Bonds, did you kind of consider any performance on how Star Bonds are doing? Did you look at any reports? That's commerce. That, that one. We kind of thought that was maybe beyond the purview of the budget committee to, to then judge, you know, which star bonds would be most appropriately uh, made whole. Um, I, I think that would be for a different for a different uh, committee. Certainly, it just it seems like you would want that information if you're going to try to hold them harmless. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's well, Mr. Chairman. I, well, I think that's valid. I think uh, the the role of the budget committee would just be to de to determine what impact would be had by the budget by uh, to the budget by our legislation. I, I think uh, determinations as to the the uh, effectiveness or ineffectiveness or efficiency or inefficiency of the star bonds would be beyond our purview. Okay, thank you. And I would say that discussion would fall more into commerce and economic development um, for the status of the current star bonds projects and how we're moving forward. Yeah, so I'll cover that in the 130 meeting, not the 330. <laughs> uh, Representative Landwehr, do you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So my question is, are those classified or unclassified positions, Representative? Chairman Sutton? I, I don't know the answer to that. Mr. Lamonia, you have an answer to that? Primarily unclassified. Those positions are, I had to phone a friend for that one, Representative, but uh, those positions are primarily unclassified. All right, Representative thank Landwehr? You. Thank you. Any further questions or discussion on fiscal year 2023? Representative Burroughs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You did address one of the comments I was going to make. The other one is legislative post audit has conducted numerous uh, audits in reference to the star bonds project. So if there's information needed, I'd encourage my colleague to look under the legislative post audit that have been conducted in reference to star bonds. All right. Any further questions for Chairman Sutton? Seeing none, Chairman Sutton. With that, I will move the budget recommendations for whatever we're, for the Office of the State Treasurer for uh, 22 and 23. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second, second by Representative no. Williams. They're all asleep. <laughs> Holy cow. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion passes. Yeah. All right. That actually concludes all the um, items that we had for today. Tomorrow, um, just to let the committee be aware of, we're going to have an update on the state hospitals. And then we'll have uh, Chairman Corbett, who is going to be reporting out budgets for the Agriculture and Natural Resources Budget Committee. So until uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we are adjourned.